Amen. The power. Now, I've been teaching. I have been teaching for now. Uh, I've been teaching on now. Uh, walking with God. Okay. I talked to you about walking with God. And um, this is an aspect of our walk with God that has to do with uh, that's vital for our communion with the Father or fellowship with the Father exercising our authority in Christ as well as uh, enforcing God's will in the earth okay so I want to talk to you today about the power of prayer and uh, I've said to you before that prayer is the key it's the key to uh, spiritual awakening it's the key to success it's the key to personal victory amen and um, the glory of this of, of this revelation of prayer is that is that it also activates our spirit okay prayer activates our spirit and when our spiritual life is strong, then we are empowered to do what God wants. So the ability to yield to God's will, the capacity to do the will of the Father requires the fuel of the Spirit, which fills us when we pray. Amen? Which fills us when we pray. So, it is very, very important that we understand the mystery of prayer, the revelation of prayer. God is the one who instituted prayer. Amen. He's the one who told us to pray. And He asked us to pray because He intended to answer. Amen. So, if there is a man to pray, there is a God to answer. Hallelujah. And so the, the, the Bible tells us when you read in the book of uh, Romans chapter 15 verse 4 it says that whatever was written afore or was written before was written for our line. You can see the scriptures on the screen. It says were written for our line. And we through patience and comfort of the scriptures we might have hope. And uh, the same apostle, the same spirit through the apostle who gave us insight on why the scriptures was written, God's Father to enlighten us on what to do with what we learn. He says, whatever things that you uh, learn, you have learned, you have received, look at the scripture in the book of uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 9. He said, whatever things that you have uh, both learned and received and heard and seen me, he says, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. The God of peace shall be with you. Now, it's very significant for us to understand that God is in his word. And God means what he says. So when God says he will be with you, he means what he says. Now, we understand that by, by various references given to us in the scriptures. For example, when God spoke to the disciples, you know, sending them, you know, commissioning them to go out and preach the gospel in Mark chapter 15. You read from Mark chapter 16, sorry, 16 from verse 15 to 20. He said to them, uh, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, and he that does not believe shall be condemned. And this sign shall follow them that believe in my name. They will cast out devils, they will take up serpents. If they drink anything deadly, they shall by no means help them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. And the Bible says, after Jesus had commissioned them, he was taken up to heaven. A cloud received him, he ascended. And the disciples went out and preached the gospel. And the Bible says the Lord was working with them 
Look at verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord walking with them, confirming the word with the accompanying signs. God is in his word. You see, so when God says, I am with you, he means what he says. He wants you to function in the consciousness of the fact, of the reality that God is with you. We see the same experience, for example. This is the exact reason why Pharaoh could not kill Moses. God said to Moses, I want you to go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Now, Egypt was the one power. Every nation was threatened by Pharaoh. But then Moses shows up and looks at this tyrant and he says, God says, let my people go. The God of the Hebrews said, let my people go. And Pharaoh could not form the words, kill him. Because Moses functioned with the consciousness that God was with him, even though he could not see him with his physical eyes. And that's what the Bible tells us when you read the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 27, that by faith, that Moses he says, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he knew one seeing him who is invisible. Amen. So Moses could not see God, but he knew that God was with him. That's why it was difficult for Pharaoh to form the words, kill him. He performed miracle after miracle. He frustrated the economy of Egypt. But Pharaoh couldn't destroy him. Amen. Amen. And the Bible tells us in the New Testament, He says, I am with you. Amen. God said, I am with you. This is very, very important. Hallelujah. So, this, this is remarkable. Now, I, I want us to, now let's go to the book of, I'm talking about the power of prayer. This is our key to uh, success, our key to personal victory, our key to spiritual awakening. And so the revelation given to us in the scriptures on prayer is for our benefit. So let's go to the book of James, okay, we're going to start from the book of James. I'm going to show you some things. I've talked on how to pray. Amen. But I feel like I needed to show you some, um, some of what is written in the scriptures of what happens when you pray. And the power of prayer. And the glory of prayer. I want us to read together from the book of James chapter 5, verse 13. Are you with me? Okay. Look at it. He says, Is anyone, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any man? Let him see some. First pause for a second. He says, Is anyone among you afflicted? Is anyone among you afflicted? Is anyone in trouble? He says, Let him pray. Is anyone merry? Let him sing praise. Is any sick among you? Go ahead. Is any sick among you? Let, let him call for the elders of the church. church. And let him pray for him. Oh, for him. Uh -huh. And I know him with oil. With oil. In, the In the name of the Lord. And the prayer, look at verse 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he has he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. And he continue. Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. He said, Elijah was a man like us. 
with the same blood flowing through our veins. And then he says, he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth in by the space of three and a half years. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth its fruit. What we learn from these portions of scriptures? What we learn from this? See, which, these portions of scripture, when you read them carefully, okay, they help us out. Uh, understand that there is no trouble a man or a woman who believes in God can get into that he cannot come out of it. Whether it be in sickness or disease, any kind of infirmity, because it says, is anyone among you afflicted? He says, let him pray. Is anyone sick among you? He says, the prayer of faith will set the sick and the Lord will raise him up. He says, that the effectual of a prayer, the honest, heartfelt, continued prayer. He says, the effectual of a prayer of a righteous man, a faith man. And then he says to us there, he says, there was a man like you and I. And his name was Elijah. He lived, you see, and at that time, you see, Israel had turned away from God. They turned away from a God who brought them out of bondage, of the Egyptian's bondage. Now they were engaged in the worship of idols. Many were worshipping idols. And this man of God did not like what he saw. So he called upon God, you see, because he wanted to take to get the attention of the people of Israel. To turn their hearts back to God. So he calls upon God. And he shuts up the heavens at his work. He shuts up the heavens. And then he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain. And the Bible specifically says that he was a man like you and I. Now, the, the Bible here doesn't show us how he prayed. You have to study further in other portions of scripture. For example, when you go to First Kings chapter, you have to go to First Kings chapter 18, verse 41, 42 actually, to give you insight on how the man prayed. The Bible says that he, um, you have the scripture? The Bible says that he went to the top of the camel, okay, and he cast himself down upon the earth and he put his face between his knees. Look at it. And so Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of the camel, and he cast himself down upon the earth, and he put his face between his knees, and he said to his servant, Go up now, and look toward the sea. And he went up and looked, and there, and said, There is nothing. So the man was praying. He was praying. And so he sent his servant to go and check if there was a shift in the atmosphere, a shift in the clouds. And he says, I don't see anything. He said to him, go ahead again and look. Seven times. This is a prayer of intercession. This is, an, uh, this is prevail, we call it prevailing prayer. Amen. Where you have to pray until you receive a note of victory. Amen. This is 
a man who prays with understanding. And he's praying to a God who answers prayer. Because the servant went to check seven times. And so he's praying. And it came to pass the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea, like a man's hand. And he said, Go up and say unto her, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. He's praying for the rain to come. After it had frustrated the economy of the nation for a three and a half. Praise the Lord. Yes. And the heavens gave rain. Let's power in prayer. Let's power in prayer. So, you see, we are not the one who instituted the revelation of prayer. God is the one who told us to pray. Because he intended to answer. Because this is man's world. He willed the world to man. And so he comes by invitation. That's what I was talking about. Knowing the will of the Father. Knowing God's will. And function within the armpits, within the confines of his will. That's the secret to effecting a change in your personal life, in your family, and in your sphere of influence. You've got to know the will of the Father. That's what the Bible tells us that if you abide in me and my word abides in you, it says you will ask for whatever you desire, it will be done for you. We plan unto you. Glory to God. So, you can effect the change in your personal life. So, in this case, I want to focus, you see, because the prayer through prayer, man is able to cause the power of God to pray in our world. Through prayer, man is able to effect changes positive changes in his family, in his ministry, in his life, in his sphere of influence, through the power of prayer. Now there are dimensions, there are different dimensions that prayer brings us into, prayer ushers us into. It's through prayer, you can be ushered into a dimension of wisdom. Praise the Lord. But I want to focus on a dimension of divine kindness or divine providence. And we'll go through the scriptures, just share with you a couple of examples to see how men who knew to will, how to move the hand of God, changed their condition, were lifted from one level of glory to another. Through prayer. Amen. Amen. Like how we, we were reading in the Acts of the Apostles, how that the apostles were, they found themselves in a predicament where the community, the city, come out against them because of preaching the gospel. And they were threatened, they said, Do not speak anymore in the name of Jesus. So, they, they didn't know what to do. And they gathered together. They, they, they called their brethren. They explained what, they had, what had happened because they threw in them even in jail. What do you do? And so they, they, they talked with each other and they decided that they were going to pray. That was the only way to prevail. And the Bible says that they came together and they began to talk to God. 
He said, look upon our threats. Look upon the situation. And grant your servant that with all boldness we will proclaim your word. And the Bible says when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. It was from there that the ministry of the Holy Spirit spread throughout Jerusalem and several other places. In fact, the Bible says that men in the cities testified that these men that have turned the world upside down have come here too. The fear of God. Spread in the cities that even people came to church those that told lies and died in the presence of God. The glory of God manifested. The apostles walked in power that even people that were sick, people that were afflicted, they maimed with all these kind of sicknesses and diseases were brought before this man and their sicknesses left. If a spirit departed from their bodies. Why? Because through prayer, this man activated the power of the Spirit. Listen, we can change things. Amen? Amen. You know, let, let, let's look at, for example, the Bible tells us when you go to the, look in the, in the Old Testament, okay, when you go to the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 9, the Bible talks of a man whose name was Jabez. Okay. And it says, Jabez was an honorable man. 1 Chronicles chapter 4. I want us to read it. Okay, go ahead. 1, 2, 3, go. 1 Chronicles chapter 4. We are reading from verse 9 to 10. His mother called him Jabez, saying, because I poor him in pain. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed, and enlarge my territory. That your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. And this is God granted him his request. Now remember, this man did not choose to be born in this condition. He said the mother gave path to him in pain. He was born in a family of struggles. He was born in a favor in an unfavorable condition. But that didn't make any difference. He knew that he would call on the God of Israel. He's bound to respond. There will be a change. And so child is prayed. He said, oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. That you would keep me from pain. And the Bible says, God granted this man his request. We read several stories like this. You go to read in the book of, uh, of uh, you read about Jacob. Okay? He made many mistakes in his life. He cheated his brother twice. And his brother said he was going to kill him. So the man ran away from home. Because his brother had vowed to kill him. His mother, his father never saw him again. 
and he, he was running. You see, Jacob was poor. How, how do I know? Because when you read, maybe I should show this quickly, in the book of Genesis chapter 28, because he was talking to God, he said, if you give me clothes to wear and food to eat. This was after he had left. Okay, He's running away. The Bible says, and Jacob uh, went, this is reading from Genesis 4, 28. Okay, we're going to go through this scripture because of time. Genesis 28, verse, verse 10. Okay, the Bible tells us that Jacob, this was after he had run away from home. He came to a certain place and stayed there at night because the sun was set. Okay, so the Bible says he took one of the stones of that place, laid it on his head, and lay down to sleep. And while he was sleeping, he had this dream. And in the dream, he saw a ladder set up from the earth. It stopped reach the heavens. And the angels of God were ascending and descending the stairway to heaven. And the Bible says the Lord God stood on top of it. And God spoke to Jacob. We won't get into what he said. You read this whole portion of scripture for yourself. So when Jacob woke up from the dream, he said, God is here. He said, I didn't know it. He said, God is in this place. Do you know that God can be in your house and you will not perceive it? He said, Jacob rose up. He said, This is the house of God. God is here. And the Bible says he built an altar there. He said, This is the house of God. But I wanted to say what he said. So he made a vow in that place. Go to verse, verse 10. Move to verse 10. Look at it. And uh, let me read through this quickly. Go to verse 10 for a second. Verse 10, okay, okay, we'll, we'll start from verse 10. Now Jacob went up from by Beathiba and went for, toward Hannah. And so he came to a certain place, stayed all night there, all night, you know, there all night, because the sun was had set. And he took one of the stones of that place, put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and it stopped reached the heavens, the heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Okay. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of your God of Abraham, your father, and of Isaac, and of, of the land, the land which you lie, in which you lie, I'll give it to you and your descendants. Okay. So God began to talk to Jacob. But I want us to go, to go down to verse um, 16. Then Jacob woke up from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stones that he had put in his head, on his head, set it up as a pillar, and poured out oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of the place had been Ruth previously. Okay, verse, verse 20. Look at verse 20. Then Jacob made a vow. That's what I wanted you to see. The man was poor when he left home. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me, and keep me in this way I am going, and give me bread to eat, and clothes to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God, and this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Yeah. He makes a vow. He says, you give me clothes to eat, and food, he says, this is your house. I'll give you 10%. It's so, I'm just showing you the condition of a man here. He's running away from home. His brothers vowed to kill him. 
So he takes off and he has an encounter with God through a dream. And he's explaining to his situation, in his situation. God has made promises to him. But he says, Lord, he says, if you do this and bless me and give me food to eat, close to where? He said, I'll give you a tithe of 10%. So he takes off now. Time came when Jacob wanted to return home. His story is interesting. I encourage you to read the book of Genesis. So time comes when he is getting ready to return home and God had blessed him. He had blessed him. And when he was stood at, at his uncle's place, Laban, he had become a situation had become unbearable. God had blessed him. He was only really good times with his boss. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him that he should return home. So God has blessed him. He has a large family, animals, praise God. And so he is setting, getting ready to return back to his home, homeland. But he remembered. He remembered that there was a problem. He had cheated his brother several years before, and his brother had vowed to kill him. So he knew when he goes back home, he was a dead man. He had to go, but it was, he knew he was a dead man. So something had to happen for a change to take place. And that thing was prayer. You see what I'm saying? That thing is, something had to change because his brother had said he would kill him. So the man is getting ready to return home. He has wives, he has children, he has a large family, he has cattle, sheep. God has blessed him. And so, Let's go to the book of Genesis, chapter 32. I want us to read this together, okay, so you can, for with me. Okay. Are you with me? Yes. All right, let's read these portions. And Jacob went, are you, follow me. And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's horse. And he called the name of that place Manahim. My name, okay? And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Syria, the country of Ovido. Okay, so he's getting ready to return home. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall you speak unto my lord Esau, thy servant Jacob said that. I have sojourned with Laban, he said, I have stayed with Laban. I have stayed there until now. Uh -huh. And he says, I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants and women servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find favor in thy sight. Okay, so he sent servants before him. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet with thee, and four hundred men with him. And Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And he divided the people that was with him, and the flocks, and the hats, and the camels in two bands. Jacob was afraid. Because when they told his brother that he was coming, the Bible says, you see it, that Esau got ready. Because Esau had become a, a strong man with a large army. So when they told him that your brother is coming to meet you, the Bible says Jacob was greatly afraid and he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels in two parts. Okay, look at this part. And he said, if Esau come to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. And Jacob said, now I want you to listen to the content of the prayer of the man. He's praying because he's in trouble. So he's praying. Look, Verse 9, and Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which said unto me, Return unto thy country and unto thy kindred, and I will deal well with you. He said, You're the one who told me to return to my country. 
to my kindred. He says, you said you would do well with me. So he's talking to God. Re-echoing what God said. And he says, I am not worthy of the list of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have showed unto your servant. For with thy staff, I passed over this Jordan, and now I am too bad. Okay? He's praying. Look at this part. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the land of my brother and from the land of Esau. For I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother of the children. And thou say, I was sure do thee do the good, and make thy seed as the son of the sea, which had not been numbered from all the children. And he lodged there that same night. And took of that which came to him, to his, to him, to his hand, a present for Esau's brother, two hundred goats and twenty he goats and two hundred. I'm, I'm just showing you the content of a man's prayer. He stayed back and prayed. He wanted God to move. He wanted God to do something. He wanted God to assure him that he was going to be safe where he was going. And this is why you, you go to the next part of, of the Genesis 32, go to verse 24. Okay? That's where the Bible tells us that he wrestled with an angel. So look at it. And it says, And Jacob was left alone. And there wrestled the man with him and took a break of the day. And when he saw that he had prevailed against him, he prevailed not against him, sorry. He touched the whole of his thigh, and the whole of his jack of jack of thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go for the jack breaketh. And he said, I will not let you go except thou bless me. He said, I will not let you go. This is not a physical wrestle. Okay? The man was praying. God is a spirit. So the end is refined to hear that he wrestled with him. Is is in the Old Testament at that time was the manifestation was um, one of the manifestations of the of the Holy Ghost in the old in the Old Testament. So he's wrestling, and for you to know how he prayed, the Bible says you have to go to the book of of Hosea chapter fourteen. I believe this is chapter chapter chapter. Go to Hosea chapter twelve. Sorry, chapter twelve, verse three. The Bible says, look at it. He says, and he took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had power with God. Yeah, he had power over the angel and prevailed. Look, he said, he wept and made supplications unto him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spake with us. So, even the Lord, God of, of hosts, the Lord is his memorial. So, he wrestled. He was a prayer. He prayed. The Bible says he wept. He made supplications unto God. And you know what happened? Go back, go back to that verse. I want to show you something. You see. So he asked him a question. He says unto him, What is thy name? He says, Jacob. He said, Thy name, because he said to him, I will not let you go until you bless me. That's what we call prevailing prayer. It's a prayer that produces results. You spare yourself to take a hold of God. He was in a predicament. So he prayed. He held on to the angel. He said, I can't let you go until you bless me. And he didn't touch his eye. Every day the Jacob fell under the power. And look at what he said. He asked him a question. He said, I will not let you go until you bless me. He said, what is your name? He said, my name is Jacob. He said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. That's where the nation of Israel came from. He turned into a nation through prayer. For he says, for as a prince hast thou power with God or with men. As a prince hath power with God and with men. And has prevailed. Hallelujah. And Jacob asked him, and he said, Tell me, I pray thee thy name. He said, Wherefore is it that 
thou wilt also ask after my name. And the Bible says, he placed him there. He placed him. The man got blessed. He never remained the same. You know. And how? Let's see what happened next. You know, the Bible tells us that because he's praying, he doesn't want to die. He's going home, but he knows his brother is going to kill him. So, the Bible tells us that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. Remember the book of Proverbs 21, verse 1? So, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And it's like the rivers of water he turns in whatever he wishes. So, something happened when he prayed. I want us to go to the book of Genesis, chapter 33. And I want you to read with me. Amen. Look at it. Are you with me? And Jacob lifted up his lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came. And with him four hundred men, and he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel, the two wives of Jacob, and unto the two maid handmaids, and he put the handmaids and their children. Forced and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph in Hadamus. <laughs> and he passed over before them, and he bowed himself the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. And Esau ran to meet him, and embraced him, and fell on his neck, and he kissed him, and they wept. Praise God. Hallelujah. He embraced him and wept. The Bible says, the heart of the king, look at the scripture. Look at the scripture. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the water, the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he, whatsoever he wishes, it, he, he, he wills. So, he says, the heart of a man is in God's hands. Amen? It doesn't matter how wicked a person is. How difficult it may seem to be. God can change their heart. And so, the Bible says that Esau was ready to embrace his brother. Oh, glory to God. I read of another portion of scripture. Amen. This, this will encourage you as you do your Bible study. Of a man who had received a death sentence. A death sentence had been passed over him. That he was going to die and not live. Bible says, God told him to set his affairs in order. He sent the prophet. And he says that he should set his affairs in order. Because he was going to die and not live. And I don't know if there is anybody who's received such a report, you know. You go to the doctor and they examine your health and they say you have three days to live, three months to live. There's nothing we can do. This was a death sentence. It was passed over a man. The book of Isaiah chapter 30, 38. Look at it. But in those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus says the Lord, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. And Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall, and he prayed unto the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I, I beseech thee. Now, this is the prayer. The man is praying. He received a death sentence that he was going to die and not leave. He didn't want to die. So he's praying. He says, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth. He said, Listen, he said, Remember how I have walked before you in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And there is a kaya. 
wept. He prayed and wept. And the Bible says, look at this part. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah saying, Go and sit to Hezekiah. Thus says the Lord, the God of David, thy father. I have heard thy prayer. That's so important. He said, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. And behold, I will add unto thy tears fifteen years. And I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city. I don't know if you're following me. I'm just showing you men that changed their situations. They changed their circumstances through the power of prayer. God answered this man's prayer by saying, because you have prayed to me. Because you have prayed to me. He says, you are not going to die. He says, I'm adding 15 years to your life. They said with Jacob, because he prayed, he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. He said, what is your name? He said, my name is Jacob. He says, your name will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. Because as a priest, thou hast power with God and with men, and has prevailed. And the Bible says, he blessed him. And surely you read the scriptures. Jacob was a blessed man. Amen. No one could kill him. He died a good old age. And you know how he died. He even knew when he was getting ready to die. He mounted his bed. He called his, all his children. And they prophesied into their future. He told them what was going to become of them. And he lay down and rested. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And that is our portion. Amen. Amen. We are not going to die a perpetual death. We will live to see the glory of God. He says, look at it. He says, I'll tell you now. Remember previously, let's see, previously, Hezekiah, this Hezekiah who was preserved, had been invaded by the king of Assyria. Okay, he sent one of his officials with threats attempting to discredit him and dethrone him and take over the kingdom of Judah. The, 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 uh, seize his seat and dethrone the king of Judah, Hezekiah, at that time. This was a rude king, the king of Assyria. And we're going to read some of the words he said in a moment. Because he said when he came, when he sent his servant, he said, Tell Hezekiah. Not to trust in a God, not to be deceived. Actually, he says that, that he should not trust in the God of Israel. He should not be deceived by the God in whom he trusts. This is a king who had no fear of God. He was a rude king. And he, he pronounced threats after threats over the king of Judah. But the man knew his God. And I read this portion of scripture years ago that stared me up when I wanted God to move. Praise God because we're going to read it. I, I want you to read this for yourself. Amen. Because I know that it will bless you. Go to the book of uh, I, I think it's verse 37. Yes, of Isaiah 37. First thing. I want you to go ahead and read this. We have it from the New King James Version. Amen. All of you. Praise God. Amen. Okay. Go ahead. I want you to read I want to follow the, 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 the context. Okay. Okay, go ahead. That, thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Do not let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you, saying, 
same job. I think there was an error. Glory to God. Amen. Go to verse 43.
The prison towers sprang open. And he brought him out and he freed him. You see? You read that several other places. How a million soldiers came against Asa, the king of Judah. And he had over, I think, 500 of 180,000 men of war and a million soldiers came against a man, his nation, the king. And he understood that whether he had nothing, whether he had a few people, if he called upon God, God would respond. He looked, he stood before the million soldiers coming against him. And he says, in the name of the Lord Father, he says, Lord, in your name, we go against this multitude. And the Bible says God smit all those multitudes and they, they ran away. Defeated his enemies. Because the man called upon God. So what can what can be done to us? To stop us from experiencing victory and success. Nothing. I'm just I'm just showing you from God's word. I've been teaching you how to pray, pray in the right way, using the name of Jesus. But look at the victories that were wrought by those that went ahead of us through prayer. Men had a covenant with God. At that time, the Holy Spirit had not come, but they understood the covenant. They knew how to will to move the hand of God through prayer. How to will God's hand. And when he prayed, God responded. A man who was born in poverty, a man who was born in affliction, when he called on God, God responded. And he brought him out of trouble. Amen. Now, now, in the New Testament, we have a secret. And that's praying in the spirit. Praying in the spirit. And using the name of Jesus. So first, you've got to know what the will of God is. You have to know. That's what was showing you the content of the prayer. Of this man, you are a God who dwells between the cherubim. There is none like you. They knew how to minister to the Lord. You see that also in, in, uh, in, in Second Chronicles chapter 20, where three armies, the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the inhabitants of Mount Seir had banded together against Jehoshaphat. They didn't have any man power to stand against them. He calls up a prayer meeting. People fasted and prayed. The Spirit of God moves upon a young man, stood up and began to prophesy. And they receive the strategy on how to defeat the enemies. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. When I want to show you two, at least two verses, two or three verses, and we'll close. Go to the book of, of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Verse 2. Read that portion of scripture. What, you, what does it say? He said, for he who speaks in a tongue, who, who does not speak to men but to God, he that speaks in, a, in an unknown tongue, he doesn't speak to men but to God. He said, no man understands it, but in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. So when you speak in tongues, you're speaking mysteries. Mysteries about your future. Mysteries about what God has called you to do. Mysteries. The Moffat's translation calls this divine secrets. Now, Go to first, first Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. Read that one. But as we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery, in the hidden wisdom of God, ordained for the ages 
Do you know what that means? I don't have time out to explain this. Okay? But it says, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom. When you're praying in the spirit, or speaking in tongues, you're speaking hidden wisdom. You're speaking mysteries. It's hidden wisdom. It is the wisdom of God. It doesn't make sense to men of the senses, men of the flesh. It is hidden wisdom. Do you know what that wisdom is for? He says it was obtained before the ages for our glory. It was obtained for our promotion. It's hidden wisdom. So, now, let me, let me show you the last, last portion of scripture. We need to meditate on this more, but we don't have time to look at it. I want you to read that one. I'll go to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. Re read that one. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. Uh -huh. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are mine. And the bad things of the world are the things which are despised. God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. They are not fresh to grow in His presence. Now, and look, I wish I had time to measure up this one. He says, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confirm the words, to shape the words. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And the best things of the world and the things which are despised, things that are despised by natural men, he says, God has chosen to bring to nothing things that, are, said, things that are despised and things that are not. Which means things that do not, when he says things that are not, it means things that do not exist in the natural world. To bring to nothing things that do exist in the natural world. That no flesh should grow in his presence. So, in the, in the red, you see, so we use the things that do not exist in the natural world to destroy things that exist in the natural world. So through speaking in tongues, someone had a diagnosis of a cancer or a tumor in their stomach, it dematerializes. And they can't explain how. That's the wisdom of God. There's so much in this portion of scripture or, or We'll touch on that next time. He says, things that God has chosen things, best things of the world. The things that are despised by the world. When he's speaking to Roka Baba, Shiba, he said, nonsense. But that's where the power is. That's where the power is. It is an antidote to fear and timidity. So much to say, but let's let's stop here. Stand on your feet and let's just thank the Lord. Amen. <laughs> we thank the Lord. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. We magnify you. You are worthy of all the praise. You are worthy of all the glory. You are awesome. You're gracious. You are kind. You're wonderful. We magnify you. We bless your name. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your praises. We thank you for your glory. Oh, hallelujah. Blessed be the Lord. Most high. Hallelujah. 